Welcome to Spiritual Calisthenics. Christ is in our midst today on Sunday, October 8th. We commemorate the third Sunday of St. Luke, the righteous Pelagia, St. Pelagia the Virgin Martyr of Antioch, St. Philip the Bishop of Gortina, and St. Ticea the Harlot of Egypt. Regarding the life of St. Pelagia the Righteous of Antioch, the Lord loves sinners with an abiding love, we are told. And it is easy to imagine that he must have loved the venerable Pelagia, Pelagia with a special fervor, because this egregious sinner not only sought repentance for her misdeeds, but then went on to become a pious and ascetic saint. Born in Antioch, to parents who were intensely observant pagans, this third century saint fritted away her youth. Blessed with beautiful features and graceful limbs, she soon became a popular dancer and an accomplished actress. So wanton and reckless were her ways, however, that she fell at last into an abyss of outright prostitution, which brought her great wealth, even as it deadened and degraded her soul to any awareness of God or spiritual beauty. Pelagia seemed doomed to a life of moral collapse, but the Almighty took mercy on her and inspired her to confront the iniquity into which her existence had descended. The miracle of her awakening took place at one morning around 250 A.D. as she was passing the church of the holy martyr Julian, where she, the famed bishop St. Nonus, was delivering a powerful sermon that had his listeners entranced. Each Sunday, the luxuriously wealthy and remarkably beautiful courtesan was accustomed to riding about the city in a gorgeous carriage pulled by a team of mighty Arabian horses. But on this particular Sabbath, Providence was clearly at work. As Pelagia neared the church, her progress was slowed by a crowd of pedestrians, and she began listening to the eloquent words of the bishop that were ringing from the pulpit inside the Basilica of St. Julian of Antioch. All at once, Pelagia felt a burst of light illuminating her weary soul. Stricken by something in the prelate's voice, she also experienced a sudden wave of overwhelming remorse for her wasted life, and vowed to return later to learn more from this holy bishop, St. Nonus. When she visited him later for instruction, the bishop, vi the bishop vividly described the dread judgment of God and the grim rigors of perpetual hell. Deeply moved, Pelagia listened in rapt horror to St. Nonus' stark catalog of punishments reserved for those souls that have fallen into everlasting perdition. Devoured by quenchless fire, the condemned souls shriek and bellow in anguish, while the roaring demons goad them without mercy. As the bishop described these endless torments, Pelagia sat motionless and afraid. Was it too late for her to change her life and save her per precious soul? No. With a matter of minutes, the scales had fallen from her eyes, and she began to understand that her entire life was being lived as a mistake. She was in danger of spending all eternity in the howling depths of hell. Filled with contempt for her former life of promiscuous pleasure and expensive luxury, the shaken courtesan fell to her knees before the bishop, while imploring him with words like these, Have mercy on me, a sinner, holy father. Baptize me and teach me repentance. I am a sea of iniquity, an abyss of destruction, a net and weapon of the devil. The good bishop responded without hesitation and promised to give the penitent the baptism for which she now yearned. Nor did he fail to keep his promise. When the time came for the sacrament to be administered, Pelagia was thrilled to see that the deaconess of the church, Blessed Romana, would be her godmother. Tutored later by Romana in the essentials of good Christian living, the now reformed Pelagia reflected long and hard on the grotesque error of her earlier, deeply tarnished life. Soon she became a model of piety and rectitude. Whenever she was tempted by the devil, she quickly sent him on his way. Then Pelagia wasn't finished yet, however. Soon she decided to gather up all her valuables and turn them over to the bishop for distribution to the poor. He was only too happy to receive the glittering jewels and coins, while declaring loudly, according to church historians of the period, let this be widely dispersed, so that these riches gained by sin may become a wealth of righteousness. Within a few days, the entire treasure that had been gained through rank prostitution and deception was turned over to the hungry and the poor, whose lives were made better through this blessing. Intent on completely rebuilding her spiritually, her spirituality, St. Pelagia then journeyed to Jerusalem in a hair shirt and there began an entirely different existence while disguised as the pious monk Pelagius. She took up abode in a, in a cave near the Mount of Olives, where she wore man's garments and lived a simple life of austerity and devotion. Throughout the region she became known as the beardless monk, and her true sex was not revealed until the end of her life. Bishop Nonus did not forget Pelagia, however, 
More than three years after her departure, he sent James the deacon to Jerusalem to visit his friend, Brother Pelagius. James found her cell. She came to the door. He conveyed the bishop's best wishes to the woman he thought was a monk. And she did not reveal her true identity, but simply thanked him politely and asked him to revisit her soon. Returning to the cell a few days later, however, James found that the monk had expired. It was only while they were anointing his body that they discovered that Brother Pelagius had been a female. Pelagia died around 284, according to church historians, and her tomb on the Mount of Olives has been a place of pilgrimage ever since. St. Pelagia's life serves as a remarkable testimony to God's willingness to forgive all sinners, no matter how deep or long-lasting their transgression. Her story shows us God's love and acceptance of all people, regardless of what their lives might have been like prior to their conversion. God's forgiveness is not reserved for a few, but freely offered to all. In, the image, in your image, in you, the image was preserved with exactness, O Mother. For taking up your cross, you did follow Christ, and by your deeds, you did teach us to overlook the flesh, for it passes away, but to attend the soul, for it is mortal. Wherefore, O righteous Pelagia, your spirit rejoices with the angels. With fasting did you consume your body utterly. With vigilant prayer did you entreat the fashioner to complete forgiveness of your former deeds by granting you which, O oh Mother, you did receive, the path of repentance you have shown to us. From St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, Brethren, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, meaning that our stewardship should not be forced out of us, should not be something that is compelled, but rather something that we freely give. And the more we give, the more we will receive. And as God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that you may always have enough of everything, and we provide in abundance to every good work. Meaning that this isn't just talking about wealth because not everyone has wealth, but that what God has given you, the strength to do the deed that you need to do, God will give you even more than you need so that you can accomplish the task that he has set before you. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who will supply seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your resources and increase the harvest of your righteousness meaning that we're not talking about physical wealth. We're talking about the wealth of your spirit, the wealth of your soul, the wealth of your virtues. This will multiply. You will be enriched in every way for great generosity, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God, meaning the more we give of ourselves, the greater we become. The more we abound in goodness to God, the more we give, the more we receive. The Gospel according to St. Luke. At that time, Jesus went to a city called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the city, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Now, keep in mind for the burial customs of the Jews is that the body had to be buried within 24 hours. So it's not like in today's time where if someone died, they might not be buried for a week. The idea of embalming was not a process at the time. Uh, you would begin to decay rather quickly. So... When someone died, they would wake the body in the house that night, and then the next day they would be burying the body. There was also a very specific funeral process because it was considered defiling for someone to touch the dead. And so the body would be wrapped in a sheet. Uh, people that were uh, taking care of the body would uh, prepare it as such. And so the people that were carrying the body of this widow's son would have done so in a very specific way. Now, to further give context to this, this is the only son of this woman. And this is of some context here because Jesus Christ is the only son, the only true child of the Virgin Mary. And a large crowd from the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. And he came and touched the buyer, and the bearer stood still. Now, the reason why the bearer stood still is because, as I said earlier, to touch the dead is defiling. There's a reason why they are wearing sheets. There's a reason why uh, they are special washing procedures. Uh, no one is supposed to touch the body. So when Jesus Christ touches the buyer, it's technically the idea of he's, he's making himself unclean. It is defiling to touch that. And so they stood still wondering, oh, well, you don't do that. But of course, they don't understand what's happening. 
Jesus Christ is life itself, and life itself is touching death and destroying death. This is one of the three resurrections that Jesus Christ does, that he shows us. The little girl, Jairus' daughter, who had been just dead within a couple of hours, the widow's son here in Naim, who had been dead at least 24 hours, and then the great miracle which he will do uh, is the raising of Lazarus, who was dead three days. Uh, and so this is important for us to show us that Jesus Christ is Lord of the living and the dead, that death cannot consume him, death, death cannot defile him. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and he gave him to his mother. Now, one might ask, why did Jesus Christ raise this young man? Part of this is to say that this woman could not take this. She's a widow, and this was her only son. Uh, so God knew that this was going to break her. She could not handle this. And so the son was given to her in order to uh, take care of her until she died. Because obviously this is a very unnatural thing for a mother to bury her child. Um, this is to show us that God does not give us more than we can possibly handle. He will be there to help us. And we have to also understand that this is showing us that, yes, God does miracles. We should hope for miracles. But it's not always going to happen. So what is the ultimate truth of this is that God is Lord over death, that we have eternal life in him, that nothing can defile us. Because death, prior to this moment, prior to Christ, was seen as something that has cut us off completely, we're dead, and so we weep because we have eternal separation. But now there is no longer separation, that our loved ones are united again in life through him. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. So Jesus Christ showed mercy in what he did for them. I hope that you've enjoyed today's spiritual calisthenics. Have a blessed and wonderful day.